I'm going to introduce myself with my camera on and I'm going to turn it off, mainly because my computer seems to be giving up the ghost today, uh, but obviously not as, as bad as some people's in the meeting today. Um, but so I'm Matt Hazel. Um, I'm a consultant clinical science trainee currently, so senior clinical scientist that works for Red Cell and Neonatology. I'll let Tom introduce himself. Hi, um, I'm Tom Bullock. I'm a consultant clinical scientist and I work in the Red Cell Immune Hematology Department in Bristol. Great. Have, have I got control or are we just relying on, are we saying next? Next. OK, so um, here's a really nice representation of what Tom and I consider that we're not. Um, although you haven't seen us in our office together um, behind a closed door. <laughs> so there, there may be a passing resemblance. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll share I my, my if I get my glasses. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. A bit, a bit more up here. That's fine. <laughs> um, great. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so this is a nice example here of what the NHS employers website um, uh, uh, portray a consultant clinical scientist as. So over on the left hand side there is uh, in, the, in the large purple square is a great overview um, of what a consultant clinical scientist does, uh, service delivery, strategy and policy, research, teaching and training. So I'm um, happy to input and always enjoy input in those areas actually. So it's quite a versatile and wide ranging role. And then on the right hand side is a really nice breakdown at the levels that we tend to work at and where you might find us. So health system level, organization and board level, directorate level and department level. So at times it can be quite a challenging role, but it has to be said it's also a very, very interesting and rewarding role as well. So just moving on to the next slide, please. So, um, you know, what, what are we? So we work at the same level as the medically qualified pathologist. So uh, represented there on the left hand side with the scientists alongside the, the medics. We do work hand in hand with those. Uh, we're obviously more experts, if you like. We have expertise in disease and pathology, but we're more experts in the laboratory side rather than patient care. So we're not medically trained in the sense that we don't we don't necessarily understand to a full level um, some of the medications and things and stuff like that. And it always makes for an interesting case note as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure about you, Tom, when you do get on the phone to one of your clinical colleagues and they reel off every single medication that a patient's on under the sun. Spelling it, let alone understanding what they do, is, is often often difficult. Um, we combine uh, years of scientific expertise, basically, in the same way hand in hand that a clinician uh, has uh, years of expertise in medical training um, to assist in patient care, diagnosis of disease, um, and lead in services. Um, we have a wide range. Uh, you know, we we obviously also see a, a, a wide range of um, medical and clinical staff um, in our departments and things. Uh, and and uh, we pass exams uh, based by the uh, Royal College of Pathologists. So we do part one and part two FRC path. Um, Tom has gone through the uh, the process of part two. Just going to close the door. My 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 six week old baby is just crying upstairs with my wife. So apologies. I hope you couldn't hear that in the <laughs> Just pull that door up. So uh, next slide, please. So essentially, uh, I, I think the nice easy way to think about us is that we're experts in our field, much like you guys are experts in uh, transfusion practitioners and things. We're experts in our field and there's a really good example of an expert in their field there. A nice slide built by Tom Bullock. Can't take the credit of that joke, uh, <laughs> who was a garlic bread expert. So uh, next slide, please. So how, how we see ourselves, uh, a nice easy way of representation to put it simply is split across three ways. So service development and research and, and development, that, that side of things. Uh, we're also a clinic, you know, have a background in clinical representation, working with our clinical colleagues, looking at um, patient care and that sort of stuff. And also a third of our time is built around education and training. So we, we do provide education and training. You do see us sat on some of the courses, even the one that you've, you've been speaking about today. We do often give lectures on the, uh, the NMA course around certain aspects of blood transfusion. Next slide, please. So um, how, where do we sit in NHSBT? Well, NHSBT, as we all know, is a large organisation, much like your hospital trust, lots and lots of different departments in there. Tom and I, uh, we work as part of Red Cell Immune Hematology, but you'll find consultant clinical science across H&I, so histocompatibility, immune ge genetics. They're in microbiology, um, uh, component development laboratory as well, so a broad uh, 
difference in clinical scientists and it's not clinical scientists there. Um, we have a uh, potential of cross-functional roles. For instance, I myself am involved in the procurement process at the moment for um, machinery down in testing um, for uh, blood typing uh, and things like that, the tests in use. You might find us across working, in, uh, working with teams in donation and manufacturing. We quite often, you know, we, Tom and I, we do work closely with our h and colleagues. So obviously we deal with, with aspects of certain platelet uh, products and things, but we generally have a knowledge of vein to vein process, which enables us to have a joined up approach to our patient care. Next slide, please. One of the main things that we do, um, we do undertake as part of our role is we sit on a, a range of rotors. So uh, there's two main rotors. There's the patient facing consultant rot rotor uh, that is hospital facing. Uh, and any if there's any things like transfusion reactions or special component requests, any sort of clinical advice around blood product use. Uh, and management or planning before surgeries and things that you know that those contacts come in through the patient facing rotor but we do sit on a national red cell amine hematology rotor as well during the daytime where our seven laboratories across nhs england will contact us and as we said that they're both interesting rotors but the rci one i don't know about you tom i do find it quite challenging to actually yeah. get anything else done in the daytime because seven laboratories calling you about whoever whichever patients they've got coming in uh, and as part of that role, when they contact us, they might contact us about a low hemoglobin. They might contact us about a uh, potential HDFN case. It's our role then to go off and contact the hospitals, discuss with the blood transfusion laboratories, ensure that they're supported with what they need, whether they've got the products or they've got a, set, a plan B for what products to provide patients, or even contact the clinical staff to understand what's happening with patient management. So it, it, it's a versatile role. It's quite interesting. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as, a, as a general overview, uh, we undertake leadership and service development as well. So on the left hand side there, we um, chair or, or co-chair meetings with national red cell immune hematology groups that focus on genotyping, manual serology, flow cytometry, sort of main areas of our service that's grouped into those um, uh, bodies. And then we have uh, uh, um, representation from whoever else is involved. So we might have um, external representation on the flow cytometry group. We have external representation from UK NECAS, uh, but mo mostly made up of um, biomedical scientists and, and clinical scientists working within, within RCI and part of the senior management team. Uh, we we um, we have tactical review of uh, of where our services is going and 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 develop and do horizon scanning um, there uh, to help develop our service. Uh, we undertake continuous improvement, represented by that blue arrow circling that man with his hands in in the air and arrows going up. Uh, and also we undertake clinical audit as part of our role um, for service development and leadership. Next slide, please. So the final slide from me, uh, obviously I have mentioned research and development quite a lot. Here's some really nice examples from Tom and I of papers and bits of work that we've been involved in. Um, not to blow our own trouble, it, it is a very small snippet of the research and development that we do undertake. Um, and we, we produce quite a lot of publications in relation to BBTS. Tom is heavily involved in the British Blood Transfusion Society, uh, sitting on the, the, the sitting on the body in, in your second role now, isn't it? I think you were part of the editorial yeah. team. The scientific uh, meetings uh, and conferences, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, we try and get involved in that. I, I myself sit on uh, UK NECAS and to Tom and I both uh, sit on guideline writing groups for the BSH. So um, that gives the background to us. I think that's my last slide for me and I'll hand you over to Tom. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. So, so Matt's described really well the different areas that we work within in NHSBT within our blood service roles. Um, but we also work across organisations as well. And Matt began to describe some of the things that we do as consultant clinical scientists. You're not just working kind of within the box of your, your blood service role, for instance, but um, we input on national bodies uh, as well, like BSH, RCPATH, the National School for Healthcare Science, the IBMS and BBTS as well. Um, we also participate in multidisciplinary team meetings. So um, we have consultant clinical scientist trainees and consultant clinical scientists participating in the haemoglobinopathy uh, regional team meetings, inputting on uh, different transfusion advice for patients with haemoglobinopathies, because these patients are often 
quite difficult and quite challenging to find blood for. So from a blood service perspective, it really helps to have a blood service representative on those MDTs. Uh, so we can plan transfusions, discuss availability of blood because those patients might have variants or mixtures of antibodies that makes blood provision and things quite challenging. It's just so we can uh, plan ahead and provide best care for our patients. Uh, Matt's already mentioned about guideline writing committees as well. Uh, and we also do a lot of teaching and lecturing of both uh, patients and public medical and scientific staff, which is really good, you know, lecturing to a, a wide base of people with a broad knowledge of your subject area, because actually questions that come from the public can be just as challenging, if not more challenging than some questions that you would get from other consultant hematologists, for instance, who would have quite an in-depth knowledge of your subject area. So it's really good to be able to, to lecture. Uh, to different uh, groups of people with different levels of knowledge about transfusion. Um, I, we, we run and lecture on MSc programmes. Uh, a new MSc in transfusion and transplantation has been launched here uh, in collaboration with UE, uh, but it's a distance learning one and it's open to all NHS staff uh, who want to do an MSc in transfusion and transplantation. Um, you know, I'm a module lead on, on one of those modules. We also lecture in, in conferences as well, so the IBMS conference and BBTS conference, uh, and you know, obviously, like many, uh, you know, many, many of you guys as well, you know, submit posters and do and do lecturing at conferences. That's kind of part of the, say, the third of our role that's teaching. Next slide, please. So that's within NHSBT. Now. The consultant role within NHSBT in terms of RCI is still a new role. And as you can see, it, you know, there are kind of different sections to it. But how, how does a consultant clinical scientist role fit within a hospital trust? You will already have consultant clinical scientists working in a hospital trust in things like clinical biochemistry, um, microbiology, perhaps public health England. And, and more, more consultant clinical scientist development is happening in histopathology as well. Um, there is a document that's out online and the, the cover of it is here and that describes the role of the haematology and transfusion consultant clinical scientist. So within a hospital trust, the need for a consultant clinical scientist in transfusion is often going to go hand in hand with uh, haematology and COAG because those disciplines within hospitals are often uh, all done together. Next slide, please. So the need for consultant clinical scientists within hospital trust can vary depending on the trust and, and actually what that role involves can vary because we all have different gaps within different trusts depending on the size. But as an overview that a consultant clinical scientist within a hospital trust is most likely to be working within one large trust or, you know, within a multi-site trust uh, with, with lots of different sites. OK, now there might be some shared overlap um, between existing posts. So some of the roles in some trusts that are done by TPs and biomedical scientists and consultant haematologists or registrars might actually form part of, of the role of a consultant clinical scientist. But really, it depends on your individual trust as to where your service gaps are and where your needs are uh, as to what you would like a consultant clinical scientist to do within your trust. Um, and the need often arises due to the lack of staff groups. You know, we all know there's shortage of, of, of staff, you know, endemic within the NHS. And wherever those shortages are, you know, in, in nursing, nursing associates, you know, in, um, in um, uh, physician associates within, within the medical profession, they're being plugged by different roles that are being made up. And an element of that feeds into the role of the consultant clinical scientist. We're there to fill uh, roles that obviously there are workforce shortages in. And actually, um, those traditional roles, those traditional perhaps medical roles, uh, don't quite fit with the evolving pace of, of science. Um, but it also, you might be doing those roles as anyway. You know, there will be scientists or working within trust who, in senior level positions that are already fulfilling the teaching, the service development, the research, the contributing to external bodies. We're all aware of scientists nationally who are leading services, um, and, and and actually, it just might be formal recognition of your skill set. You know, becoming a consultant clinical scientist and doing the exams and doing getting the qualifications might just be, you know, a formal recognition of a job that you're already doing. And therefore, you know, so you can perhaps get the correct remuneration for your role because you, you have those, you know, those letters after your name. It's a necessary evil. Um, 
And a couple, again, I've listed a couple of things, including laboratory service leadership and clinical service leadership and service redesign, things that are quite um, pertinent at the moment with consolidation of trust. Next slide, please. So within a hospital trust, if you're working within a, a joint haematology and, and transfusion role, there's a variety of areas where a consultant clinical scientist could input, and all of these are contained within that document that I showed you at, at the beginning of my talk, that service document, which I would recommend you read if you're interested in consultant clinical scientist roles. Some of these roles might be done by advanced nurse practitioners, such as anticoagulant dosing and investigation uh, and treatment pathways as well. But these are sort of things that a consultant clinical scientist could participate in or could lead uh, within a trust, depending on where the gaps in your service are. And, you know, in certain trusts, there are consultant clinical scientists in haematology and transfusion. Um, I think there's, I know there's one in Plymouth and there's also one in Bolton. Um, Sharon Gray is a consultant clinical scientist working within haematology and transfusion. And there are consultant clinical scientists within hospital trusts who are studying transfusion only, who are uh, developing those roles within the trust. But you can see here, there are a number of roles within trusts that actually consultant clinical scientists can participate in. And some of those, if we look at the haemoglobinopathy uh, testing, you know, it, again, is uh, is participating in multidisciplinary teams, giving those that expert advice because of the changing pace of diagnostic technology, being able to input on actually, you know, these are the limitations of our tests, of perhaps genotyping, for instance, and, and just explaining to a clinician what the results of those tests means and, and how you can apply those tests and what the limitations of that testing are. Um, it, in terms of hospital transfusion laboratory uh, leadership, traditionally these may have been uh, led medically, having a haematology consultant who leads, uh, you know, who is responsible for transfusion, but that may change to a, a scientist led service in certain trusts. Direct patient care is slightly more challenging. Um, traditionally, you know, as scientists, we're in the lab, we're, we're behind the scenes, but actually consultant clinical scientists can participate in anemia clinics or drug uh, dose adjustment clinics. But I, I think one of the, the blocks in drug dose adjustment at the moment for early stage consultant clinical scientists, because this is an early program, is, is that non-medical prescribing um, with, with obviously drug dose adjustment. Um, we would need to do some kind of supplementary non-medical prescribing qualification in order to input on those clinics. Next slide, please. So we're all aware of the Transfusion 2024 document, um, at which identified an urgent need to strengthen support for hospital transfusion labs to ensure safe provision of care for many patients. And the role of the consultant clinical scientist feeds into this in many areas. And we've discussed, you know, um, site consolidation, you know, sites joining to become bigger sites in, in this meeting already today and some of the things that, that the challenges that that throws up. And I think that, you know, consultant clinical scientist uh, role would, would help to um, maybe uh, input into some of those problems. But some of those problems are caused by, you know, pathology modernisation and consolidation and, and the kind of evolving needs of the health service where you have a, a mix of people with different skills feeding into NDT meetings. We're all aware that technologies are becoming more complex and therefore the interpretation of results and the provision of advice based on those results may require a little bit more input from a scientific side and traditionally uh, medics you know, may not have had that background and so may not be able or be best placed to provide that scientific interpretation and clinical advice based upon that. And it all it's all reflected in the you know the changing face and pace of healthcare. You know, there are a lot of challenges, particularly with pandemic pressures uh, and other improvement projects on top of that. Um, you know, in order to support that and to um, basically provide the best uh, advice about which tests to do and when, so we're not wasting time and wasting money. Uh, consultant clinical scientists within haematology and transfusion can feed into that. Um, I've already discussed workforce, ch workforce challenges uh, where you have shortages of staff within certain uh, groups, you know, leaving gaps in your service provision. There's a number of RCI hospital transfusion laboratory integration pilots where um, consultant clinical scientists within RCI are essentially uh, on hand at the end of the phone to provide expertise or advice for any RCI related query uh, and actually 
um, some integration of hospital transfusion laboratories uh, with um, RCI services, regional RCI services, to prevent any kind of duplication of work, uh, duplication of workflow, and therefore delay to transfusion, uh, may be something that we look at in the future. But even more simplistically, the there is now through the higher specialist scientist training program, which is the program that you need to do to become a consultant clinical scientist. There's a career pathway from early stage, you know, trainee biomedical scientist right up to consultant status. Um, and that's something that just hasn't been available before. There's always been that glass ceiling. Um, you know, you, you get to a certain point in your career as a scientist and you cannot go any higher. Um, yet you have the abilities and you have the skills set um, to demonstrate that you have a, you know, a, a very in-depth, very ex expert scientific knowledge. And now there's that recognised qualification to, to prove that and to, to demonstrate uh, to demonstrate that expert knowledge. Next slide, please. So in summary, we are a new breed of consultant clinical scientists with RCI. Um, however, you know, we're all aware that consultant clinical scientists already work within other disciplines within pathology. Um, and I, I'm under no doubt that the role will involve. And at the moment, we wear a number of hats, you know, R&D, service design, service leadership, um, publication, teaching, um, expert advice. You know, there are a number of hats, but we all wear different hats in our career. But um, I think that within cons the consultant clinical scientist role at the moment, um, some of those responsibilities may change, but we tend to use those uh, three different areas as, as cornerstones of our practice. Um, developing the role within NHSBT will allow close NDT working with clinical teams and hospital transfusion laboratories. So what I spoke about in terms of feeding into NDT meetings and integration of RCI and hospital transfusion laboratories, and, you know, obviously, uh, the phone and RCI consultant um, advice, as well as forward integration of perhaps testing algorithms. Um, and in summary, the role, as I've just mentioned, provides that that pathway from trainee biomedical scientist to consultant scientist, which has not been there before. Um, that's it. That's the end of the presentation. If anyone has any questions to Matthew or I, uh, next slide, please. Then please, please feel free to ask and we'd be more than happy to answer them. I think Karen, you've got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Matt. And um, obviously, there's a very clear need for a consultant clinical scientist within transfusion. I think, sorry, I just take my face mask off. NHSBT are doing an amazing job to get you in the places you need to be on local, regional, and national level, um, developing guidelines and such like. Um, and I just wonder, although you've got close links with the hospital, I feel like there's a trick being missed there. Um, obviously, we had Janet as our consultant previously within NHSBT, mm -hmm. and it was so useful to have her on the ground. Is there any plans to try and integrate you more into hospitals to have shared time with hospitals? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Karen. Um, at the moment, um, I'm not aware that RCI have a plan for a shared role uh, between RCI and a local hospital trust, but I'm quite keen that those roles do develop um, because, you know, having a knowledge of hospital transfusion based a hospital transfusion practice and blood service practice is the best knowledge that you're going to have as a, as a consultant clinical scientist specialising in transfusion. Um, it's something that's, you know, I, I argue for, um, but it's beyond, you know, it's beyond my uh, decision. It's not my decision to make. Um, it has it has been discussed, but I think that because it's quite an early role and there are so few of us, um, they're reluctant perhaps to release us um, to undertake a role um, with a hospital with all the responsibilities that we've got in the blood service. So we'd have to give up some of the things we do for them in the blood service in order to take on additional stuff. And I think that's possible, but it just needs a, a just a grown up conversation just needs we just need to sit down and have that conversation. Matt, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just I just wanted to say I, I think I think there in some areas there is potential plans from it. I, I've, I've heard some sort of rumblings, but not no confirmations. And, you know, um, some areas it's more difficult to recruit um, mm. even within RCI. 
um, to, to have the, the, the trainee and then the consultant or clinical scientist at the end of it. So potential in those areas more to have that cross crossover. Also, there are consultant clinical scientists in transfusion training in hospital trusts. And actually what you might find is that they end up with joint roles with NHSBT. But I, I, I do think it's important to have that. The trouble is we're, there's never going to be enough of us in NHSBT to cover all of the hospitals that are present in NHS England. Um, and I think, you know, Karen, and I obviously offered my services and I know Tom would, would gladly offer his services as well for any sort of support that you would need. And there are other consultant clinical scientists that can potentially do that as well, while certain trusts don't have transfusion leads. Um, but I think it's it's probably more beneficial to have an open door, realistically. You know what I mean? So mm. if, you, if you need support, contacting the blood service, say we need support around this area, particular area of transfusion, because it's not just me and Tom. Do you know what I mean? And and we we this this is a good example of remote working working well. This meeting. Do you know what I mean? We we don't necessarily need to be local or on site. So like Tom might be inundated at the moment. I might have a bit more free time or there might be another consultant clinical science trainee or consultant clinical scientist that has availability to be able to support a trust. So although it's great having that joint role, I think it's actually more beneficial having that open door and being able to provide support as and when it's required. So to NHS England. Yeah, I do agree. So um, hopefully there's more people coming through the system. I think that's harder for the hospitals to put people mm -hmm. through than an HSBT. I think they're definitely best placed to do that. Um, but I know within hospitals, as we were saying earlier, with just a, a standardised policy for transfusion is just so hard to achieve because there's so much variation. And I think if there was um, perhaps more input from people like you at perhaps the hospital transfusion committees, that would really help to drive practice forward and standardise things. I know a lot of trusts are also currently struggling um, with just attendance to transfusion committees. And I think it's because there's a lack of drive within the trust, there's a lack of direction. And I mm. think that's something which potentially you guys could really help with. Yeah, we, 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 I mean, obviously we do get invites when, when people remember us and we're, we're generally happy to attend as long as it doesn't clash with something already in our diaries, unfortunately. Um, it's important for us to attend it because it's good, it's good opportunity for us to understand what's happening outside of NHSBT. So, you know, and provide that, that assistance, you know, um, you know, parts of our roles, for instance, recently we wrote um, a national risk and impact assessment related to the blood tube shortage and stuff so you know being able to feed into hospital transfusion committees around that sort of thing not only to gain information from your side to implement in our own risk assessments but also feed into your into yours it's that it goes back to that same conversation about documentation that i had earlier you know there's no point in reinventing the wheel if there's things that we've done or you've done that then realistically we should be able to do those together and pull what we need to our own organizations i don't know if you've got anything to add tom uh, no, I think you've covered it. I think you've covered it quite well um, in, in terms of getting impetus on your hospital transfusion committee meetings to um, make decisions. You know, the National Blood Transfusion Committee. Um, there are bodies that you know input into that, but yeah, I mean, consultant clinical scientists from NHSBT would be happy to to obviously input into those meetings um, if we have if we have the time. But as we say, there are so few of us at the moment that the demand out, out strips the supply as it were um but matt has you know obviously uh, input you know inputted on that thank you how many are in the system currently with any nhsbt uh six, i think it's the six. Five, five, six, six. Yeah. yeah is there plans to build on that yeah well, there, absolutely. there's yeah i mean it, it's a five-year training program so um yeah, and it, it, there are a lot of hurdles. So, you know, there may be six in the system at the moment, but six might not finish. Um, there's also, you know, plans to build on that. Um, but yeah, there will have to be contingency in place for, you know, if you, if you don't complete the, the training, because it is you know, obviously quite challenging. But even then, you, you know, how many do we need? Um, and identifying people that want to do it is just as difficult as identifying people um, that are able to do it. You know, you might have someone um, who is an amazing biomedical scientist, senior biomedical scientist with qualification and experience um, to start the course, but actually um, it's not the right time in their life. Um, you know, they've got other priorities. They're not that, you know, interested in doing a five-year doctorate with FRC PATH examinations, a research project. 
going to university and doing all of those other things um it, it is a challenge you know we found it a challenge to find people that actually want to do it and particularly in london you know where you would think you know the career opportunity in london is amazing in terms of experience patient cohorts responsibility um yeah it's, it is it's a good opportunity but like like tom says it's it's we train this to, towards the same similar qualifications and same qualifications as medical medical consultants but the interesting thing if you compare the pathway for medical consultant training to the pathway for consultant clinical scientist mm. training one they, we're pigeonholed into five years um you know i mean i think i think there's there's, there's aspects that so I think it's an emerging training course, if you if you if you ask me, and I think I'm hoping, I personally hope that over the over the coming years, the time frame might relax slightly to allow people to move out of it and back into it and things and achieve mm. certain aspects of it while not on such a rigid five year frame. Mm. Um, so, but uh, who knows? We'll see. Hopefully, ho hopefully, hopefully, having gone through it, we'll be able to feedback and input and make potential changes for, for the better for training. Thank you. I think your role is brilliant and I think there is an absolute need for it. Um, and the more you can involve yourself with the hospitals, I think absolutely the better for everybody. Yeah, Thank we're you. definitely keen. We're definitely keen. And if anyone wants yeah. to know about the training pathway or is interested in the role, you know, and you want to go to your, you know, your, your senior leadership and say, you know, this is something that I want to do. I think we need to develop someone in this trust then. Matt or I are more than happy to to talk about the role and talk about the training and, and so on and so forth. But yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Um thanks, thanks Tom and thanks Matt. Uh, I'm just conscious of time. Um well thank you very much for, for coming and speaking. It was really interesting. Um thank you for inviting us. No problem. If if anyone has got any questions, I'm sure if you know they can either email you both or, or email them to Sam, he'll direct them onto you if if that's okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I'll sh I shared my email. I'll share my mm. Twitter. Tom's got Twitter as well, and I'm sure he'll share his email as well. So, by all means, you know, any way of contact you want.